Temple, founder of World Black History on Periscope. And we are about to go inside the Pullman, Chicago Pullman National Park for a tour. And hello, welcome, welcome. So my name is Janice and we're about to go inside the Pullman National Park. Um, I want to dedicate this to my father who's unable to walk and to see this. I want to say happy Father's Day to all the fathers. So we are going, this is the Pullman State Historic Site, Pullman Factory Tours, first and third Sundays, May through November at 11.30 a.m. There we go. So, oh, where do we Welcome get the, the tour? Oh, thank you. Where do we get the papers? Oh, thank you. There is more. Oh, no. Well, wait. No, we're together. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, thank you. Is this the first time you've been here? It is my first time I've been here. Do I want to get your picture? I saw you look like you were going to take a picture. I am taking a picture. Okay. Hi, well, what are your names? Ed and uh, Denise. I live in Pullman. You live, I live in, in Clinton. Clinton? Clinton where? Illinois. Oh, really? Is there a Clinton in Illinois? I didn't know anybody lived in Pullman. <laughs> It's a um, real, it's yeah, a real it's town. a community right across the street there. Yeah. Are you descendants? <laughs> right. <of George? laughs> I live in Pullman. Yeah. You live in Pullman? Yeah. And what's yeah. your name? My name is Carl Torhan. Carl this Torhan. is my wife, Denise Murchison. Oh, okay. Well, it's a pleasure to meet you both. And who are you? Yeah, I'm Janice Temple. I'm sorry. <laughs> nice to meet you, Janice. Nice to meet you, too. And what, what brought you out today? Well, I love history. Um... I was the first uh, travel writer to come here and to uh, let everybody know that the park was open. So I'm back. But do you say, please do us a favor. Tell them to go to this website and to vote for Pullman. Vote for Pullman. Vote what for are we Pullman. vote? Why are we voting for Pullman? To get so federal we can funding. Get, oh, to get federal funding. Okay, yes. so you guys, you hear that? Go to vote. Yourpark.org. And, and you vote can for vote Pullman. every day up and until vote. July the 8th. Vote every day until July the 8th. Awesome. So please share this out and let others know. That's awesome. Thank well, you, that's Janice, for the know. opportunity. Well, yes, we want you guys to have federal funding. So what is this map of? Can you explain what, what it is? Oh, the sure. Is? This is... Um, the main factory site where George Pullman built his luxury train cars. Yes. And there's like a, a little lake out there that they use for cooling. Oh, the lake is still there? No, but you can see the area where the lake was. Okay. It was out near Cuyahoga Grove, which is the area to the west. Oh, okay. Where is everybody going? Oh, on the tour. So we're going to let you oh, go. Okay. Enjoy the tour. <laughs> All right. So we're going back around to the front now? He's going to take you around to the front of the back. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Okay. So we're about to go on the tour, guys. Hey, how's everybody doing? So tell me where you guys are joining from. I'm going to turn this around. That's the factory, 1910, 1990, and 1998, 1908, 1891. I'm a relatively new resident, so I, I've been trained by the state. I may have facts wrong. I will try not to have facts wrong. I profess to know everything, but sometimes it sneaks up on me. Now, this map that most of you have been given, the area that I have highlighted on my map in yellow is all that remains of the factory. So it's very little. 
Over the years, a lot of uh, things have been deconstructed, fallen down, fires. We've had, we've had it all. I will give you a brief history of George Pullman. 1831, he was born. 1848, he was an apprentice factory, uh, no, apprentice cabinet maker for his family business. His father also moved houses. So when he died in 1853, he took over. He came to Chicago, made his fortune, because he didn't come from a wealthy family, made his fortune raising the buildings downtown for the sewer system. He moved out to Colorado for a short while and then came back in a, in a supposed bad train experience for an overnight trip was where he got the idea for sleeper cars. Now, the first picture we're looking at is facing the direction. And exactly, here's the clock tower. This is 1883, three years after he purchased this property. He purchased 4,000 acres at the time. And it cost over $800,000. He built the factory in this location for a couple reasons. He wanted to buffer his workers from the negative fact, uh, city workers and their negative, uh, I can't even think. What am I saying? Their right. negative way of, way, way of life striking. So he moved out here. The rail line was in existence. Lake Calumet was much closer to the Pullman factory than it is now. The Bishop Ford would have been gone. Walmart would have been gone. So through the St. Lawrence Seaway to the Atlantic, he could get raw material. So it was a perfect location for him. He built the town adjacent we have South Pullman over here. North Pullman's on the other side of the factory, down a little bit. And he did this to make his workers happier so they would end up never going and striking. Didn't work out. He did provide modern conveniences that weren't the norm of the day. Tenements were the norm. So he had indoor plumbing, beautifully landscaped surroundings. And it, he wanted it to look like a rural garden. He had all the beautiful buildings, like the factory, the Hotel Florence, face the train tracks. So that when people were riding in, the first thing they saw rising out of the prairie were these beautiful buildings. Now you can see, it, it wasn't much going on here nearby. It was, it was basically prairie to Hyde Park. So they were isolated. Now, Pullman did have his own conveniences here for the people, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. He bought it in 1880, all this property, and by 1881, it was open and producing trains. That's pretty fast, considering I have an office at the Hotel Florence, and we've been closed three years for just renovation. So, in 1882, there were over 11,000 people living and employed in Pullman, so it, it was a major deal. Now, the Columbian Exposition, which was a World's Fair in 1883, no, sorry, eight, I don't remember. 1893. But, thank you. He, they had a, a, a train that came to this neighborhood and this factory because it was such an interesting new idea for factories. So it was so unique that people came from all over the world. In fact, the hotel was built for the visitors from international. The workers couldn't go in the hotel. It was, it was the only place in town you could get a drink, but visitors could. So now let's look at this next picture. This is a photograph of the original sleeping car. It was made of wood. Not a very practical, practical um, material for any kind of car. But in the beginning, he brought over 65% of his workers were skilled laborers from Western Europe. And he brought them over to do everything. On this, at this site, they did their own upholstery. They did their own metal work. 
They built every part of it. And the thing I like to point out is nowadays we use a stencil for the paintwork on that. But that was all done by hand. Now in 1865, before this factory, Pullman owned other factories, one in Detroit, one in Hammond, and I'm not sure of any more. But in 1865, he developed the car known as the Pioneer, which was attached to Lincoln's funeral train in um, uh, Chicago down to Springfield. It cost over 18000 to build this car, which was still an enormous amount of money. But this was the exposure his sleeping car needed to take off. And that's how he went from there. Now, he built five classes of cars, hotel, parlor, reclining room cars, sleeper cars, and diners. But the genius in him was he didn't sell them. He leased them. So he controlled a hotel on wheels. He controlled the quality. He took in the money. It was genius. Now, he was very inventive and innovative. He had other issues, but... He, 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 he did employ, which is controversial, there's no doubt, recently freed house slaves to be the porter. And this was a job that paid well below what the standard rate of pay was. The porters had to work very hard, not a good crowd, let's say, and they, they made most of their money from tips. Um, in 1920, Pullman was the fourth largest employer of African Americans in Illinois and the second largest in the nation. And they had their fair share of issues and strikes too. And we have a, a display inside today for the Pullman Porter Museum, which is definitely worth a see. Okay, very quick. <laughs> is very interesting because it's located exactly where we are right now. This was the entrance for the workers. Now something that points out just what this kind of living is. Now some of the interesting, like I said, Pullman was a businessman. He was a straightforward businessman and he promised his workers, or his uh, stockholders, a 6% return all the time, no matter what the situation was. The way he organized the town, the less skilled you were, the farther away you were, the farther you had to walk. The most skilled lived on this front row here, and that was the doctor's house and the surgeon's house right in front. So if you were very unskilled, you had to walk by all your supervisor's house to get to work. The lease was an issue. 30 pages. And it had a lot of uh, rules. You couldn't plant a garden. You couldn't sit on your porch. Although there are pictures of people sitting on their porch, we think they were staged. You couldn't... Uh, well, the trash was taken care of. There was trash pickup, but there were a lot of rules. They could come in and evict you at a moment's notice. The town was dry. The only place you could get liquor, like I said, was the Hotel Florence. So Roseland sprung up, which is right under those viaducts. And they would have people carrying, I mean, they, the, 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 the workers would come carrying pails of beer home that were lined in one inch of fat. I guess to help keep it cool, but Pullman was wise. He had spotters out, and if you were spotted with that, you were in trouble. So Pullman also had a big, like Neiman Marcus complex called the Arcade. In the three, there was a recession. He cut the rents. I mean, he didn't cut the rents. He cut the wages. He laid people off, and the people started having real financial difficulties. When you're in the factory today, we have, they look like picket signs. They're very small signs that we put out in front of people's homes 
during house tour and they were our interviews that were taken at the time by uh, uh, some local uh, uh, newspaper and it states what condition each person was in at that time, how much they owed, who they owed, etc. So it is quite fascinating, but that that's another long tour by itself. So we, we won't go through all that yet, but I can direct you to other resources. Now this picture I'm going to skip because we're going to talk about what's going on inside. This picture. In 1910, that beautiful lake that you might have noticed in the first picture is gone. The landscaping is gone. In 1910, George Bullen died before then, a couple years before then. 1910, his lawyer, Robert Todd Lincoln, took over. And he was more of uh, no frills. By that time, the, uh, the, the government, the Supreme Court, had ordered that it was a monopoly to own a town and a factory, so Pullman chose to own the factory. In 1990, the state of Illinois purchased the Hotel Florence and all of this property. By 1998, an arsonist had attacked. But the good news was, three days before the arson, the state of Illinois finished binder after binder study of every nook and cranny of the factory. So we had a blueprint of what to do and how to rebuild. We'll talk more about the arsonist and his motives when we get inside. Any questions? All right, let's go. Do you have one? Thanks for joining guys. I'm gonna um, end this scope and start over on the next channel.